Yeah, they're quiet. All right. All right, since there's no traffic, everybody that likely is going to be here is here. And if they show up late, that's fine. So what I'm going to do, just so you know, we're going to record this to make it available offline if you want to review. Um, just send us a message afterwards. But I'm going to go ahead and mute everybody now. Hopefully. Mute. All right. Suppose I'll unmute Roger. Mute. Okay. So you want to say something polite to make up for all the shit I'm going to say? Yeah. All right. So Roger's going to say a bunch of things. All right. We got to. Hi, Holly. Okay. So welcome, everybody. Today, uh, if you've been to the last couple, you kind of know how this is going to go. What we basically are going to do is Roger's going to go over some information and give a little presentation. Uh, today, it's going to involve... Um, Basically programming, we're gonna focus on the analysis, the, the, the drill, and then the reinforcement to help improve your skills. To kind of set you up uh, for a well-rounded way to build a program, get better at your skills, and get going. Uh, feel free to take any notes, and then when we're done with this, we'll do a little bit of practical for those who want to uh, participate. Uh, we are going to focus on the practical aspect with the press today. So if you have those size bells, you can use that. Um, and I'll just kind of take you through a sequence that I use. Um, from there, uh, be sure if you don't already like us on the Instagram, go through and like us on the Instagram. Uh, this is free, but feel free to donate if you're so inclined. Um, if you are, just message me and I'll send you a link. If you don't, that's okay. We still love you. Uh, except for, um, you know, we just won't be able to eat. I'm just kidding. I won't. Uh, but anyways, without further ado, I'm going to leave it to Roger. Roger, why don't you go ahead and take over and all right. uh, go ahead and set your screen up. All right. Let me hide all the stuff I'm not supposed to be looking at. All right. So... Before we get going, um, something I want to point out is this is this is a take. This is uh, one way of doing things. We we don't think we have the answers. Uh, this stuff isn't necessarily right. It's not necessarily wrong. Um, it's out there to give people a framework. Um, you know, some things to consider when they're working with people. There's a guy named uh, George Box. And if you search for him, make sure you use his first name too, or you might pull up some racy stuff accidentally. Um, but there's a quote that's usually attributed to him um, that basically says all models are wrong, uh, but some of them are useful. So he was a statistics guy, but that quote's usually uh, attributed to a lot of scientific models. And the point of that is there's going to be something that I say today that I don't agree with, or I don't agree with all the time. Um, but we have to give ourselves some framework, some parameters to work within, or we're just kind of flailing around and lost. So keep that in mind. Um, for things that you don't necessarily agree with or don't make sense, think about why. Um, and, you know, also keep in mind, too, the level uh, that we're working with today. This is about skill acquisition. So we're not going to go over, um, you know, really advanced science-y stuff. That's going to be more for the, the next phases of programming. Um, but we'll go through the, the slides now. Um, so, you know, this whole idea of being, uh, being ready, um, you know, a lot of people aren't. A lot of people go right into their skills and, and they want, you know, they want to get right into doing the snatch test or doing complexes or flows or whatever they want to do. Uh, they're not, they're just not ready for them. So what we're focusing on today is the first bit of programming. That's just your, your, your raw materials. Those are your skills. Um, if you are trying to press a half body weight size bell, but you don't have a good press, you should probably start there before you start layering on a bunch of uh, capacity. 
So uh, just a quick overview of some basic uh, programming goals. So first we've got skill again, that's, that, that's what we're going over today. Uh, after that, we're going, you know, you, you go into capacity generally, it's more about quantity. How much work can you do? Uh, your skills should be tight by then, then you're gonna start layering on the, the ability to do more work. Um, and then at the, at the end, we really work with objectives. Um, this is binary, meaning you either hit the objective, you don't. You're, you're trying to pass a, um, you know, you're trying to pass your strong first skills test. You either do it or you don't. You're trying to lift a particular weight. Um, but you, you know, I, I wanted to go over these to show you where these generally fall on the continuum. And you've got to start with your skills. Um, so that's what we're focusing on today. And we've got um, a three-part framework that we use uh, to evaluate um, to evaluate skills. So let's, you know, let's construct a scenario here. You either you or you've got someone in front of you and something just doesn't look right. Uh, maybe there are several things that don't look right. Where do you start? What do you do? Um, the first part is the analysis. Um, you know, this is where you, you are really trying to, um, you're not just doing more reps because more reps aren't gonna fix the problem. You're not shouting at someone to do it a different way because that's not working. Um, this is the analysis phase where you're, you're really starting to examine um, what is it that what is it that's going wrong exactly? Um, once you do that, you really have an idea of what the problem is, which, you know, uh, by the way, that's the first step is usually what most people skip. Um, and then they go right to the second phase. That's where you go into drills. And to select drills or for drills to be relevant and useful, you've got to make sure that your drill actually solves the problem um, that, that you have and in order to do that, in order to match those up, you really need to understand the nature of the problem. Um, and then afterwards, we're gonna get into some reinforcement. So not like, hey, I did this one time and it looked halfway decent, but you know, I do this well all the time, it's automatic. Uh, we're gonna go over some basic strategies to uh, structure there. Uh, and as, as usual, if you guys have questions, um, put them in the chat and Jeremiah will unmute and tell him to shut up for a second uh, if we have those questions. So. Don't, don't hold back, chime in if you have any. Um, so when we get into analysis, just a, a, there are uh, some basic modes that most people have access to. So there's mirror training. Mirror training is not bad. Uh, it's really easy to set up. It's really easy to do. Uh, works well enough for things like squats and presses, um, but you'll find, you know, especially with things like ballistics, it's not very practical. You know, if you're trying to do a kettlebell swing where you're looking in the mirror, something's probably gonna go wrong. Um, for more advanced techniques, you also want to be aware that your, your eyes uh, and, and the reflexes associated with them um, will make your, um, will change, will modulate your force. So you may not want to be staring at a mirror. Sometimes it's useful, sometimes it's not. Uh, then we have video. Video is accurate, it's detailed, and it's easy to track your progress. You take a video of something you've done, uh, you look at it over weeks, months, you can, you, can see the pro uh, you can see the progress. You can slow it down, you can go slow motion, it's awesome. The problem is it can be a little bit slow, <clears throat> excuse me, be a little bit slow, um, and it really does lead to obsessing. A lot of people who will show me videos will you know, spend months trying to, to fix this little problem that's probably not that big of a problem. Um, so there, there is a potential downside to video. And then of course, coaching, um, it's, it's information with, with analysis. You know, coaches, uh, if you have a good coach, that is, it's done for you. Um, that's probably the best way to go, but it's expensive. So um, whatever way works for you, you wanna consider um, some mode of analysis. Don't just, you know, say, oh, that felt good. I don't, who cares how you feel? You have no idea how you look. Um, you need something to verify that, that something you did was successful or not. Um, so if, if, we, if we look at um, analyzing some of the problems, we again like to use uh, a three-part um, or a three-phase process. And what we're looking at is where is the problem? So generally a lot of your, your, your skills, with the exception of the getup, um, but you could probably do this for each phase of the getup, um, generally your skills are going to fall into a setup phase uh, there's going to be a transition phase and then there's going to be a completion phase so um, if we stay with the theme of the kettlebell swing your setup is uh, you know, your original height position um, the transition phase is after um, after you have uh, begun your hike and you're starting to bring the kettlebell forward and up uh, and the completion phase is going to be um, it's going to be the lockout position at the top. Now, of course, you've got to analyze how things are looking on the way down, but you can just repeat that same process in reverse. 
Um, but either way, if you're if you're looking at skill problems, um, it's a good idea in in our opinion to work those phases in order, um, or at least just check off the box. You know, if you're going from if you have a problem in the transition phase uh, and a problem in the setup phase, work the setup phase. You know, generally, if you get into um, you know, strong overhead pressers, they will tell you that a good clean makes a good press. So a clean is part of the setup phase for the press. If you can't get the bell up to the, the top position and ready to press it in a good position, you're, you're less likely to be successful. So make sure you work your, um, make sure you work your phases in order. And uh, if you have multiple issues in multiple phases, start with the, uh, the setup phase first. And you know, maybe you don't have any problems, just look at it. Is there a problem there, yes or no? Um, oftentimes, the problems that you have later in the movement will really be a product of a faulty setup. So some basic, um, some basic problems we, we really wanna look at. Um, you know, your, your, your phase one is, is, like I said, it's your setup. Um, this is really going to determine how, how well the rest of your skill will go most of the time. Um, you can write a faulty setup, but it's going to take extra energy. Um, you, so you, you, you probably want to have a solid setup. Um, some anatomical considerations. Can you get into the position you need to? You know, uh, We're going to probably stick with the swing for the duration uh, of this just because that's what we've been going over. But if anyone you know, wants to hear something else, we can do that. Um, but you know, if, if, you, if you see someone who's really uncomfortable in the setup, there may be an anatomical limitation. There may be something getting in the way. Uh, so, you know, you want to ask yourself your question, uh, the question, can I get into the setup position uh, comfortably? If, if you are applying that same thing to the press, um, can you clean a bell? If you don't know how to clean, you're probably not going to be able to press. Um, maybe it's anatomical, maybe it's not, but you want to make sure that there's nothing uh, in your body that's restricting you. So when you get into, uh, we get into the biomechanics of the situation, you, you want to consider, are you in a good position to generate force? You know, last time we talked about the counter movement uh, as we begin the kettlebell swing in the hike position. So that would be a, a prime biomechanical uh, consideration. If you see someone down in the hike, they look nice and comfortable, their spine's neutral, they look ready to go, but they are all the way buried back into their hips. There's no room to generate um, force and they start to come up a little prematurely. You could work with biomechanics, cue them into that shift, uh, work with their leverage and get them a lot stronger from the start. So the, the take home here is that for each of these phases, you want to consider, um, consider some anatomical things and consider some biomechanical things. These, these are, these are uh, the, the two big buckets that a lot of your problems will fall into. And later on, of course, you can uh, work on mechanics, but um, most people are, you know, if you, you clean up the other two things, mechanics are going to be easy. So Phase two problems, you know, phase two again is, is the transition. So this is after you come out of your hike in the swing and you're, the kettlebell's on its way up. So, you know, you're, you're, this is where you're looking with a lot of your skills at pain. Um, this is where a lot of it will be present. Is there any, um, and can you really maintain the position that you're set up again? You know, a lot of people, um, I've seen people with a pretty solid hike, but as soon as they, they start to come out of the swing, there's disconnect to the spine. Um, they're leaning back rather than standing up. So this is, you know, th these are some basic uh, anatomical deviations and we want to, uh, we want to make sure that um, we're evaluating those in, in phase two. So uh, same thing with biomechanical, a lot of the, uh, the biomechanical stuff um, of all of this is going to be center of gravity and, and keeping your levers ideal. Uh, finding a way to oppose gravity as little as possible. So probably a more applicable uh, example would be your press. You know, if you're your, your press is here and you're nice and stacked and you're about to go overhead, um, is it going to be, uh, are you in a more ideal position here or if you start way out here? And the answer is you're gonna be, you're gonna be in a better position here to begin the ascent because you can keep the kettlebell centered, centered over your hip a little bit better. So, um, you know, the, the phase two problems with the biomechanics setups, you know, how, how much are you opposing gravity? Usually that's where a lot of those problems uh, will happen. Then when you're getting into your, uh, your phase three, you know, the phase three determines whether or not you completed the skill, okay? Uh, can you get to lockout successfully? So uh, if you, if you uh, look at a lot of the um, phase three issues anatomically, you're getting more into end range. And I think actually in this situation, um, the, the kettlebell swing will work too. You know, do you have full range of motion at your hips? If you can't, you're gonna get a lot of hyperextension through the back. 
um, with the press as well. Can you uh, can you get the arm all the way overhead? You know, is your is your face ten feet in front of your body uh, to get the kettlebell up? You know, are you stacked? Are you leaning back? What's going on? The phase three uh, anatomical issues will usually reveal end range um, end range joint problems, and and that's where we're going to get a lot of mobility stuff. And then, you know, the uh, more of the biomechanical stuff is going to be, are you in a place where you can demonstrate control, okay? Uh, you're, you complete your skills, you know, whether you're, you're pushing the bell overhead for the press or you're holding the bottom position of the squat, you don't want to just drop down and then go right back up. You don't want to just press the bell and let it fall. You want to demonstrate control. You want to demonstrate mastery, okay? Um, and that, that um, Phase three is going to go all the way down to, or all the way to uh, setting the bells down to the floor. Okay, you want to consider all of these these considerations for moving weight safely. A lot of these ideas are going to be reinforced as we go. So, um, you know, and and this is just a a small number of things that can go wrong with different with these different phases. But uh, again, just to summarize, if you're if you're trying to analyze a skill try to figure out where the problem is. Is it a setup problem? Is it a transition problem? Is it a lockout problem? And then once you've, um, once you've identified which phase the, the primary problem is gonna be in, and again, we're gonna work phase one first, we're gonna work the setup first, then we're going to evaluate those problems in terms of anatomy. And by anatomy, I just mean, can you get into the position you need to get in? Um, and then you're going to evaluate biomechanics. You know, maybe your hips are plenty mobile, but you just have a shitty setup. So your your first swing is garbage. So you're gonna you're gonna look at both of those. Um, so again, just a, a simple framework. You're gonna find some exceptions, but this this serves us pretty well. Um, now, once we get into uh, deficiencies, now um, what we're really looking for is. Uh, trying to fit the right, the right solution to a, the right problem. Um, often you'll get random drills and, you know, as, as trainers, I know there are a lot of trainers on the call we have, um, you know, we have these things that we keep in our back pockets. It's like, oh, well, if this is a problem, then do this. If this is a problem, do that. Well, you want to make sure that you're actually solving uh, the problem that someone has. So for the sake of analysis, once you've identified the proper phase, what type of problem is it? Is it a mobility issue? And, and basically mobility, do you have full range of motion or enough range of motion? Can you get out of your own way? Um, a lot of people can't, especially as trainers, we train positions um, to death and we're just not ready to get into a different position. You know, let's say we worked our, uh, you know, we've worked our, our bench press to try to get a particular weight up. And now we're suddenly having some issue getting our arm overhead to get our overhead press up. So the, these, uh, we want to identify, we want to identify what the uh, restriction is and mobility is, is very frequently um, a great place to start. Um, again, we also want to work these in order. So then um, we go to control, okay? Your, your mobility is fine anatomically, you know, nothing's really getting in your way, but for whatever reason, your muscles just don't know how to control the joints you need. So this is where we're going to get into um, a lot of the drills we see. A lot of them are really just control drills, uh, which is fine. They're very effective, but only effective if that's the actual problem you have. Um, and the last, the last type of drill is going to be cognitive. These are going to be your mechanical drills. Um, you know, this is where you're, you're trying to drill your snatch and making sure that your arm doesn't stretch too far out. So you're, you know, you've got a sheet or a towel in front of you. you know, these are drills that are really focusing on um, your execution of the movement, provided you have enough mobility um, and enough strength through that range of motion in order to move the weight safely. This is just, hey, I checked all these other boxes, but it still doesn't look right. Okay. We're good so far. All right. So once we get, um, once we've narrowed in on the problem a little bit more, um, you want to look at what we call movement qualities. So a lot of time when you get drills, they really just restrict themselves to the basic pattern of movement. So if your swing's not good, work your deadlift. Well, that's not bad advice necessarily, um, but the, the swing and the deadlift have um, some key similarities, but they also have key differences. So yes, the, the movement pattern is identical, but where the load is, how the load moves, um, you know, the, the place where the load 
the load ends up, there, there's some pretty significant difference, uh, differences between the two. So we don't want to just use a basic movement pattern and assume that a drill that has the same movement pattern will necessarily improve your skill. So um, a quality is really a combination of attributes um, rather than just a basic pattern. So we do have pattern, we need to consider that. So when you're setting up a drill, um, you wanna make sure that it, it's, it's got some similarities between it and the movement pattern you're trying to improve. Um, we wanna identify essential joints. So um, we, we may not need to do a hinge, but you know, if, we're, if we've identified that um, there's a restriction in hip mobility, then we're going to go after that, even if it's not necessarily fitting into the hinge pattern, we've identified um, the, the essential joints and we can work them in isolation if need be. Uh, handprint and footprint. Um, handprint and footprint are really just, are you on one, uh, one foot or two? Are you doing one armed or two armed? Okay. Sometimes you're going to do bilateral work and use both arms, but it's not necessarily going to transfer to a unilateral skill. So you need to consider that. Um, speed, especially with kettlebells, you know, we've got our, we've got our grinds and we've got our ballistics. Um, our grinds are slow, our ballistics are fast. So a, if you're trying to improve ballistics, uh, a slow drill may not help you. You may need to, especially if you're working stability, you may need to do something that really requires uh, high speed stability if, if that's where you're having problems. If you're having problems in that transition phase and your spine is not stiff enough, okay? You need to do something that's going to, to teach you reflexive stability because you may look awesome in a plank and then suddenly you get on your feet and you look like a fire hose that there aren't enough people to hold. So um, you really want to consider speed uh, as well. And then the last, the last thing, and th there are a lot of other things that you can consider too, but these are just some of the big ones. Uh, breath, you know, the, the breathing type for ballistics versus grinds is going to be different. You know, the grinds are going to have a much slower high tension breath and your ballistics are going to have a really quick uh, short exhalation. So, Think about now when, when we've gone through the process, you've, you've chosen your proper mode of analysis, you've identified the phase that the problem's in, you've identified the type of the problem. Now what we can do say, okay, well, it's this type of problem. And now we're, we're um, identifying even, even more specifically, what are the uh, particular, what, what particular, I guess, qualities uh, does the drill need to train? Okay, and, and that's where you need to consider the movement qualities, because if you do all the other phases, but the, the qualities of the drill you choose don't match the qualities of the problem you need to fix, you're probably not going to have a ton of transfer. Okay, um, so that's the first part. That's the analysis, and generally it's, it's the hardest part. Um, once, you're, once you're there, the other stuff is pretty easy. Um, it's, it's pretty easy to go through. And again, you know, now, now that we have our, our, three, basic, uh, our three basic types of uh, deficiency, you can start to categorize your, your drills a little bit more. You can find your mobility drills, your control drills, your cognitive drills. Um, you know, and, and Jeremiah is going to go over some practical stuff, and, and we're going to get into those a little bit more. Um, but just remember, you know, there's, there's this idea of transfer in the fitness world. And the reality is most of the time, we really don't know what transfers to what. You'll, you'll get people saying, oh, well, that's not functional. I don't even know what that means. Um, you'll, you'll say that's, you know, you'll hear people say, oh, that doesn't transfer. We don't know. We've studied very, very, very few of, ex uh, of these things. We've studied very few exercises. Uh, we've studied almost no mobility drills. And it's, it's really difficult to say what will and won't transfer. Uh, you know, maybe you have a problem um, standing up that isn't present when you're on your back. So, you know, where the, the idea of transfer is tricky. So um, just keep that in mind. That being said though, we shouldn't just throw our hands up. Um, we shouldn't throw our hands up and not try to fix it. And what I want everyone to come away with is every drill does not have to have every one of those attributes, okay? Uh, if, if you're trying to, if, you're, if your real restriction is anatomical, then you don't need to be in a, position that is exactly like the the kettlebell swing okay if that's what you're trying to improve and you're going to get people say that's not that's not going to transfer well one they don't know but two um you may need to work in a more regressed position you mean you may need to start on your um you may need to start on on the floor on your back and get a little more range of motion and then slowly bring it up to your feet so uh keep these drills in mind and try to categorize them and really try to work on one thing at a time so one thing we like to do is we just build a pyramid. 
Um, so we put the scale in the middle. So you know, we'll, we'll, uh, Jeremiah is going to uh, work with his press a little bit. So he'll put the press in the middle. And then he's going to come up with three different drills. And um, nothing magic about three. Maybe it's one or two. Maybe it's five or six. Uh, five or six is probably a lot. And if you need more than three drills, then you probably haven't chosen good drills. But the basic idea is to go back and forth between the drill and the skill to see where you are. So let's say with the press, you do a baseline. Okay, let's check out the press. How does that feel? Then you do a drill. Uh, maybe you've identified your one of your problems is um, leaning back a little bit too much in the press. And it doesn't feel like it's a mobility thing. Maybe it just feels like it's a core thing. So maybe he starts with um, some core work. So he does that, um, you know, picks, picks a drill that is designed to work mobility in the position he wants. And then he'll go back into the press and see if it helps. And the idea is that you, you're alternating between your, your drills and your presses to do a couple of things. When you wanna see if the drill you've chosen actually works. If you're gonna spend time doing these warm ups and doing these drills, um, you wanna make sure they work, uh, but you, you're also getting a little bit of extra work in. Uh, and you know, doing a drill to improve a skill can be a great way to have a little bit of active rest. So um, we accomplished a couple of things there. And, and by the end of uh, the sequence, you know, alternating back and forth, you should probably have um, improved your movement to a significant degree. If not, then something went wrong. Um, you've chosen the wrong drills, or maybe I'm just an idiot and I told you all the wrong things. That's also entirely possible. Um, so when we get into the best practices for drills, um, Perform proper analysis. Don't skip that step. Don't think, oh, it's probably the core. I know trainers love to say that, you know, um, global warming was caused by a weak core, uh, but there are other things out there. So do a proper analysis before you just give people shit to do. Uh, focus on the phase, okay? Do it at a time. Don't go, um, don't go um, after too many things at once. Um, work your drill types in order. So work on mobility first, then control, and then your, your cognitive, um, your, your cognitive, basically your mechanical drills. Um, work your proper base of support. You know, again, back to this idea of transfer, um, it doesn't matter that you need to end up on your feet. If you can't get the mobility that your hips require from a standing position, then go down to the floor and then find a way to um, bridge the distance between the floor and standing. And that's where we can get into our kneeling variations and, and different standing variations. You may need to put an extra drill in there, uh, but sometimes that's the difference between success and failure. Um, so you wanna consider complexity. So you should probably not start with your most advanced drill. You should probably start with your most basic and see if that helps. It'll, you know, you'll, you'll allow your body to warm up a little bit and it'll help you isolate the variables that are actually limiting you. So the more complex your drill, the more things it's gonna be training at once. So if you're doing something simple like core stability and you feel like 95% of your problem is solved by that one drill, you're gonna have a good idea that core stability was the problem. Whereas if you do your most advanced drill and you're training six different things, you really don't know what fixed it. Um, and then you wanna check your work. You wanna, you, wanna go, you wanna go back and you wanna say, hey, is this really worth my time? Um, Warm -ups, are, warm ups are important for a lot of people, but the, the time you spend doing them and how you spend doing them um, matters. You know, we, we, we don't always have enough, well, I guess lately we've got more time, uh, but in general, a lot of people don't have uh, time to do you know, a 45 minute warm up and then go into a workout. So you wanna check your work. Um, now we're gonna go over, if we don't have any questions, we're gonna go over some basic uh, ideas to reinforce the things that uh, we have learned. So let's say we've gone through our analysis phase, we figured out what the problem is, we have chosen some drills, and we're, we're pressing a lot better, we're swinging a lot better, we feel good about the way we're moving. Um, now we can come up with a few basic structures that go, are going to allow us to practice. Um, so ladders are um, probably my favorite form of structuring a workout. Um, you know, they, they don't always feel super intense. Um, physiologically, uh, and they're, they're really kind of designed that way. So generally there's an inverse relationship between volume and intensity. As volume goes up, intensity has to go down. And ladders really allow you to work a higher intensity with a higher volume. And a lot of it has to do with the total, uh, the total pounds moved, the, 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 the total work that you do, although you're doing it over 
uh, you're distributing it over a wider space. So your body gets the benefit of the work, uh, but it's um, less condensed than other forms of training, let's say three, you know, three straight sets. So, you know, if a ladder, a press ladder has 30 reps, you know, if you're, if you're doing both arms. So, you know, doing some simple math, you've got three sets of 10. If you're looking at uh, kind of a classical weight training paradigm, you know, everyone goes in on chest day and they do three sets of 10 on the bench press. And then they do the same thing with, you know, incline this and fly that. Well, think about the, the load you can use for your press 10 times versus five times, okay? You're gonna be able to lift a weight uh, a heavier weight if you only have to lift it five times than if you lift if you lift it ten. So ladders allow you to get the same reps in, uh, but they they allow you to use a, a heavier load. And um, especially when you're working with kettlebells or if you've got a specific uh, pressing goal, that can be really valuable. But the ladders also allow you rest in between. They allow you to reset. So you know if you if you have five different rungs. And you know you alternate between arms. You have the opportunity to step back and say, "Hey, what what went wrong here?" So let's say you do one rep each side. You can step back and evaluate. How did that feel? Was that good? Um, you you have more opportunity to say, eh, "I don't really look like my feet. You know, my foot position was a little off. Let me reset that." It's a lot more mindful. It's a lot more purposeful uh, rather than just you know rushing through the set. You have more opportunity to get it right, and that's why I like. So in the beginning, um, as soon as I feel like a skill looks pretty good, I go light in, right into ladder training. Whether it's ballistics, whether it's presses uh, or grinds, it's it's a it's a solid um, it's a solid um, it's a solid way to go. And this is just a simple. Uh, Jeremiah is actually going to take you through one of these. So uh, these are pretty simple though. But basically, this is you know how you add up to thirty. I did I did math. Hopefully, it's right. Um, so that's ladder training. Um, another way, uh, another way to train if you're training ballistics is to time your power. So, a lot of times when we're um, we go into ballistics, we tend to focus on volume for some strange reason. The nature of ballistics is power, and we will we will go after numbers, but we'll go after numbers, and we're not generating the same power, and we're really trying to run before we can walk a lot of the time. So one thing, one thing I like to do is I will time my reps. I'll, I'll time five reps. Uh, I, I like five because it's, um, you should be very fresh after five reps. Um, it should give you a very good idea of exactly how long um, your, your, ideal, your ideal ballistic uh, will take. You can do this stuff for grinds, but it's really meant for ballistics. Um, so, you know, as anyone who's ever done some, you know, ballistics, your first rep is usually slower than, you know, your, your second. And that just has to do with all the energy stuff we went over last time. So we, we have enough time to build maximum speed, but we're not going so long, uh, that we actually run the risk of slowing down. So we get our, we get our, uh, our, our five rep time and we figure out how long it takes to do our reps. That's how long each rep should take. And now when you're building out your workout, you can start to have an idea of whether you're speeding up or slowing down, okay? So after you do five reps, you do 10 reps. 10 is a pretty common unit. Um, this will give you an idea of how long you can sustain your maximum pace, okay? So if your 10 rep, uh, if, if your 10 rep time is not the same as your five rep uh, time would, um, would suggest, then you know you're not ready to do, uh, you know you're not ready to do units of 10, which is totally cool. You're just going to do units of seven, or maybe you just start with units of five. That's fine. But either way, you know how many seconds a rep should take, um, and that's going to that's going to include a swing switch if that's what you're going to do. If you're going to do this with two arms, you can do um, you can do a swing switch if 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 that's what you want. Either way, um, keep that keep that in mind as you're you're setting your time. But you should come away with a a a unit. My each rep. Um, each rep takes two seconds, takes one second, takes three seconds, whatever it is. Okay. Then once you have that number, you can, um, you can figure out how long your, your total set should take. And then you start to watch your timer. You look and say, Hey, this whole thing should take 45 seconds. So let's say you decide to do five rounds and you know, first three rounds, everything's taking 45 seconds. And then suddenly your fourth round, you're 47. Okay. I'm a little off pace. Let me try to pick it up. Um, or you just decide to stop working, that's up to you. But let's say you do your last round and you know, you're, you're at 52 seconds, you know you should have stopped. 
the nature of ballistics is power and you are clearly losing power. So just call it a day. You know, you don't need to end your workout, but end your ballistic practice because you are not, you are not training what it is we're, we're attend, intending to train. Um, and then we've got, you know, we've got the, the every minute on the minute timer. Most people are probably going to be familiar with that. Um, and, you know, quite simply, you take a minute, you do the amount of work that it is um, you want to do, and you see how much time you have left. Uh, this will help you, you know, with this timer, you can track your pace because you know how long it should take. Um, so, you know, you, you say, hey, that this thing should take me um, 45 seconds. I know I'm on my ideal pace. Um, and you also know you have 15 seconds left to rest. So now we're getting into work to rest ratios. We're not going to get into science, but for those of you who have studied this stuff, you understand that a three to one work to, uh, work to rest ratio is a lot harder than um, the converse, having 15 seconds of work and 45 seconds of rest. So working with your EMOM timer um, is a good way. Don't just go into it all willy nilly and, and you know, just go when the thing goes. Pay attention to how long things are taking, uh, and also pay attention to how much um, recovery you're getting. You know, maybe your maybe your pace picks up. Maybe you are allowed 30 seconds of rest, but you only need 15 or 20. Uh, there are other there are other ways to train if that's the case. So um, every minute on the minute uh, training can give you a pretty good gauge of how how your uh, your cardio is coming along, your overall pace, and how well you're recovering. Um, so some best practice, uh, best practices, this really gets into structure. Um, there are tons and tons and tons of ways to structure a workout. Um, ideally, again, we have to remind you this is skill acquisition. So alternate between grind and ballistic lifts. You can do ballistics every day. You can do grinds every day. Um, the nature of kettlebell training is that it's, it does not, um, if, it, if done properly, it's not very high fatigue. That being said, you're still, you're not even to that capacity phase. You're just layering on skills. So give your body a little bit of time to rest and learn. Um, and you can alternate your days between grind days, ballistic days. Um, start with ladder training. Um, don't go right into uh, timed power training. Don't go right into uh, EMOM training. If, if you are just getting comfortable doing your swings, you probably shouldn't be timing them. You have, you have no idea how to do a swing. And you might get a, a five rep pace, you know, and you realize, oh, it takes me, you know, a minute and 45 seconds to do five swings. Well, that would be horrible. And you're clearly doing something wrong. So wait until um, you feel comfortable with your ladder. Wait till the movements start to feel good and then move up to, um, then move into other forms of training. Okay. Um, generally speaking, if you keep the volume right around 100 reps or lower, and that's combined arms, um, you're probably going to be fine. You know, this, this one, you know, I kind of throw this out there loosely. There is some, there is some science behind it. Um, this is also something that I've seen time and again with people, uh, with my own training and people I've coached, but that's probably a good number. You probably don't want to exceed more than that um, if you're just going for basic skill development, okay? Um, remember the nature of your movements. Don't rush through your squats. Don't rush through your presses. Um, they should be slow. They're, they're about teaching you how to develop tension and what you will find is you get deeper and deeper into kettlebells that your ballistics will help your grinds and your grinds will help your ballistics. But if you're doing them the same way, you're probably not going to get those benefits, right? Um, you can alternate between light and heavy days eventually, but wait till you're efficient. 60 to 70% uh, of your max is, is going to give you results. It is going to make you stronger. There's pretty solid science behind that. So if you don't need to do 10 reps right away, um, don't do seven. If seven gets you better, then that's what you use. Uh, so let's say you're doing, you know, your swing seven plus seven. Um, the, again, we're developing efficiency um, before we really get into capacity. And make sure you rest. You know, you can rest in between. Uh, Jeremiah is going to go over the ladders, and and you'll see how he rests. Um, you can rest in between in between ladders and in between rounds. But I'll, you know, also make sure that you are giving yourself off days. Uh, because if you're not resting, you're probably not learning. Um, and that's all I've got for you today. Um, Jeremiah is going to kind of reinforce some of these ideas. Um, let me stop sharing. He's going to reinforce these ideas with um, with some of his practice. If you guys have questions, you can ask him. If not, um, watch him and learn some stuff. All right. Yeah, before we move on, I just want to make sure um, 
that it's all clear. If anybody has any questions, to please go ahead and speak up. Um, I'm happy to address those, and Roger will be happy to chime in on any of it as well. Um, and at this juncture, if you do want to participate with what I'm doing, it's a good time to stand up and shake it out and feel good. Uh, what I'm going to do is focus on what my goal is. And um, I'm just checking in with everybody real quick as I scroll through the gallery here. Okay, um, so my goal is a half body weight press. So in order for me to achieve this, it takes a lot of practice. So the first thing, like uh, Roger had mentioned, you wanna go over is the analysis. So since it's kind of hard to concentrate on every little nuance and aspect of getting that much weight up, and for me, it's 48 kilos, which is also known as the beast, which is incredibly heavy. If you haven't done it, and I think only one person on this call has, um, it's, a, it's a task, it's a chore. So instead of just relying on a mirror to train me in that regard, what I did is I set up a video and I videoed it several times. Um, and I videoed several presses just to kind of see if there's any consistencies with presses that I'm comfortable pressing. And then what it comes down to when it's the press, when it's the weight I need to press, okay? So I've not maximized this, um, uh, my strength for this. So the one thing I noticed when I got to this heavier weight is that my spine, sniffness, my spine stiffness uh, started to, to lack and there was a bit of a mid section disconnect, okay? Um, and if you press heavy weights, you're gonna realize that you do need to have a really solid connection, especially on the side you're pressing in order to be able to drive and support that up and keep it balanced as, it, as you go. Um, so the way I structure my program, and today is a grind day for me. I have already done my, my training for the day, but uh, I, I am, I'm ready to do another set of ladders with you guys. Um, so you wanna do, I'll do a core warm up just to kind of get ready. And for me, uh, the core warm ups that work well for me beginning my press, uh, is I like to do a few bird dogs just to get uh, the rotation, anti-rotation factor going. And I particularly like side planks uh, just to get my obliques to fire. With that stiffness, as I press, I would notice I would lean here and I'd have a hard time really driving back. So using the opposite side to get under. So those are the core warm-ups that I would do. Now for you, if you have a hard time assessing what those are, again, I offer it to you just like we did on your swings and stuff like that, feel free to message us through Instagram or our email, you all should have it. And if you don't, I'll mention it at the end, but send that to us and we're happy to take a quick look for you and kind of see how we can help you gauge where you're at in, in the movement. So um, I'm gonna go ahead. I have three kettlebells here today for the, uh, the skill and the drill that I'm gonna use. I have a uh, 16 kilo that I'm gonna use for one of my drills. I have my 24 kilo, which is gonna be my groove weight for now, and I'm gonna call it a groove weight because it's what I'm gonna test my each drill with. And then I have a 32 kilo, which falls in line to about 70% of what my max is. And just going back and getting that response in order to build that strength, you, you, you want to use a little bit heavier bell. And because our ladders are going, uh, for the sake of time today, I'm gonna go one to three, but uh, if they're going one to three or one to five, you know, you can, like Roger mentioned, get a little bit heavier. So. The first thing you want to do, um, and I'm going to assume that you all are feeling a little bit better, are a little bit warmed up. If you haven't, uh, I can't see everybody that's on this call, so get some plank going or get something going to get your core warmed up. And I'm going to show you my press with this 24. Hopefully you can see my whole arm. Um, so what it comes down to, again, is the setup. That's something you want to look at. And I feel pretty confident in my setup, so I take my setup. And I'm going to clean it into the press, okay? So my clean is what I look for to be part of a good press, as Roger mentioned before. Hinching down, I do my slight rock back like we covered last week. I'm in my press. I'm gonna narrow my stance and I'm gonna drive up. Pull it down, control, feels pretty good. Okay, I'm gonna check the other side, shake it out a little bit. Clean it up, narrow my stance. And by all means, you can go into that with a clean and narrow the stance at the same time. Looking for my vertical forearm. All right, feels pretty good. I feel like I could get a little bit more 
um, out of my core and a little bit more connection with the drill. So if you're familiar with this uh, movement, I'm gonna do a Turkish getup. So the Turkish getup for me is going to allow me to uh, keep the weight overhead and in a press in vertical position for most of the way and throughout a range of motion, all the way from the bottom to standing, allow me to get my legs under me because in the press, it's not just like a shoulder, it's gonna be your whole body uh, and allow my core to do some work through different planes of motion. So setting up for your Turkish getup, and I'm not going to go over the specifics on how to do each of these moves. Again, if you, if you want additional coaching on this stuff, hit us up and we'll help you out. But I'm going to get in my setup. Hopefully you can see me. If not, that's okay. I like to step this way, so you're going to see my back. Feels pretty good. I feel pretty strong here. Controlling it down. Feels good, okay? All right, let's see how that feels in our test phase of the skill. So the drill and then the skill. Okay, so my setup. Yeah, it feels good. Feels like it went up a little bit better. So I got my drill and my skill. Did that help me? Yeah, uh, first of all, um, it allowed me to bring more awareness to the movements. I'm thinking more about what my body's doing, how does the kettlebell feel in my hand for a longer duration, and getting me prepared to lift a little bit heavier weight. So that's one drill I'll use. Um, and for the sake of not watching me do Turkish get-ups a bunch. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and show you what the next drill I'm gonna use. So I'm gonna go with bottoms up press. So for me, I don't have like a, a 20 or a 22 kilo to use for a stronger press, but trust me, a 16 kilo or lighter, depending upon your strength level, in a bottom up press will get you feeling good. So um, what I'm going with that is I'm looking to create a little bit more concentration and a little bit more curve connection in the standing position. So here, when you do the bottom up press, I'm going to opt for the clean into the rack. So not only do I have to focus on my clean, which is also an important part of the press itself, but I'm also gonna to have to engage all these core muscles that were causing me problem, and then focusing the strong legs, strong grip, and control all the way up. So whenever you do a bottoms up press, be mindful that it is um, an unstable position uh, as far as the bell goes, and you would hate to have that slam on your wrist. So keep an eye on that um, with your eyeballs, okay? So I'm gonna do my setup. So I combined it there. I sat in, this feels good. I feel really good. I got a good handle on it. I'm gonna lock it in. Control it down. Press, control, feels good. Drop it down, boom. So did my drill. Now let me see how that translates to my skill. Bring my 24, it's a, again, this is a little bit lighter. I'm just feeling the groove, uh, making sure my press pattern feels very good before I get into uh, my, my ladder training. So this could be considered your warm up. And in fact, this was my warm up today. I did some get ups with some Bottoms up pressing, and then got into my press ladder. Clean it up, feel good. Boom, good, feels good. Another good drill while we're here is when you're in this position, is this a quick trigger hand? So I'm gonna stay nice and tall from basically from my shoulder down like a plank, loose hand here, loose hand here. And I'm gonna give that belt a nice hard crush grip and feel it launch off, okay? Now, that kind of just triggers in my head when I go for that press, max press eventually, I'm gonna be locked in, I'm gonna be tight, and I'm gonna grab it and press it up. The harder you grip it, the more it's gonna reflectively activate your triceps and other muscles and get it fired up, okay? 
Now, if there is any questions there for my skill and my drill portion, let me know. Do you have any questions? All good? Remember, so you're unmute yourself if you out. Do. Yeah. I want to point something out. If you if you look at the drills he's chosen and the order he's chosen them in, um, you know, just doing some simple core stuff. It, it's it's basic. It's it's exactly where he should be. Uh, he's training a very specific quality. Um, he's he's easing into this thing. Okay. The second drill, you get into the getup. There's a lot more complexity, more moving pieces. But he has already activated his core. Um, he's already he's already done some core work. Now he's using that core work and he's um, he's going through more complex movements and he's also adding an element of shoulder stability. Okay, so um, you know you're you're going from a simpler control drill to a more complicated control drill. You can also talk about mobility. A getup has a lot of different stuff. Um, and then when he gets into his bottoms up press, um, there's definitely a physical component, but that's a little bit more of a mechanical drill. Um, same with the with him crushing the grip. He's really looking at making sure that his path of motion is ideal, that he's in, in really solid balance. So um, it makes sense that he's doing them in that order. Not necessarily wrong if you were to flip the, the, um, the bottoms up press with the getup. I would, I would ask what the relative intensity of the two weights is. Uh, but either way, I, I just wanted to point out that he's, he's doing things um, in a, in a smart order. He's going from, you know, he's going into different uh, base positions. He's going through relatively uh, different complexities and he's working the types of drills um, in order. That's all. Thanks, Roger. Okay, so if you have your kettlebells and you're feeling good, if not, that's okay. Um, I'm just gonna take you through basically what my process is when I do a ladder, how I take my breaks in between, what I do as far as each rep, okay? Uh, like I said, we're gonna go one to three. Uh, with, with, when I do ladders, some people like to go from the finish of the rung on the right side or the left side, whichever you start with, and they like to swing switch and bring it in for the, for the next one. But because I'm working on uh, the total package here, I actually set my bell down in between, give it a shake, get ready, make sure my process is complete and set up. It doesn't take that much, that much extra time. And if you're doing your press right, you're gonna feel it all over. You're gonna feel pretty juiced after you've done five reps at a 70% at a uh, of your max weight, okay? So maybe between on reps number four and five, in between the right and the left side, you take a little breather. Um, so let's give it a shot. If you've got your bells, go ahead and set up. If not, watch me and I'll feel just like Richard Simmons today. So I'm not, I'm not needing any extra tension or extra hard tension techniques at this time. So I'm not gonna use that energy from the offhand. So on that one, since it was a, it was a bit of weight on the left side, um, I kind of just kind of give it a little loose grip. I just wanna feel that it feels light to me. But as I go forward, I'm not going to release that grip very much. In fact, I'm gonna make it tighter and tighter each time. So I shake it out, I feel really good. Maybe check myself out in the mirror and then step up. I'm gonna go two. Hit to two. Shake it out, feels pretty good. I'm feeling really strong today. I had creatine. That's nature steroid. Now, if you look back to kind of something Roger pointed out in his slideshow was with the different style, the grinds and the ballistics is a different breath. So that's a much slower breath. I'm really releasing the pressure. Think of a tire getting deflated. Now I'm gonna go with rep number three. If you're doing this at home, um, great. If you're a little bit behind me, that's fine. Remember, listen to yourself and your body and how you can handle each weight. This isn't a rush. 
It's just some practice. But at where I'm at, this feels like a comfortable pace for me. Okay. So one thing I noticed on that one, uh, maybe you saw it, maybe you didn't. Um, it doesn't matter uh, if you saw what I did on me, but this is why we use video, but what, what I've noticed from feel is on that one, I started to get that lean and same disconnect that was keeping me out of my max press. So I used a little technique of driving into the bell, getting my hip positioned more under the bell to create a better center of gravity to give that third rep a better press up, okay? So that may be something you wanna consider. As you do this, try not to be too distracted with music and stuff like that. When you get heavier, you want to focus a little bit more on your, on your, um, your technique. And then bam, I'm gonna rest three minutes. Straight up, don't rush that. I would say, I'm not gonna say right now, but I would ask my phone to start a three minute timer. And then I used every three minutes of it. If I feel like I need to add a little bit more core work, cool. If I just feel like, and this is typically what I do, is I'll stay fast and loose, walk around a bit, keep moving, start to think about my next set and what, what my ladder felt like that go around. So these are all things you can use to uh, bring it full circle. So. I analyzed what my issue was. Then I came up with a few drills. I grooved the skill, did my drill, grooved the skill, did my drill, and then began my ladder training. And in between ladders, with the time I have, I kind of run a quick analysis of how I feel, how I felt, um, which is also important. Because if you think back to when Roger mentioned, if your ballistic is losing speed, then maybe it's a good time to stop. If I'm on my third ladder, and I'm at four and five and five was a real challenge. Maybe that's where I stopped for the day because I want it to be strong and I want it to be fruitful. I want my, my brain to also remember, hey, you're strong at this, this is good. And um, that's the basics of uh, how I would approach and Roger would approach in our little system of analyze, drill, skill, reinforce uh, system. If you have any questions, now's a great time. Otherwise, I'm going to not work out in front of you very much longer. Any question? All right, looks like Quinn's out of here. See you later, Quinn. All right. Cool. How are you guys doing out there, Katie? Getting it, getting it done? Are you pressing right now? Yes, I sure okay. am. All right, good. How's it feeling? Feels good. Good. All right. Phil's just chilling. I like it. Phyllis, how are you doing? So from, okay, from some of the people, breath. some of the people I was observing, just, just remember, uh, if you're doing ladder training, you, you've gotten past the second phase, you've gone through, uh, the drill and the skill part. And if you're finding that, you know, one, one rep's okay, the next one's not, you're just not ready to do your ladder training. That's totally cool. So, you know, maybe you back off and wait, you reinforce your skills that way. Um, just remember that the point of, of where we are in this continuum is to get your skills better. And from experience, just pushing ahead because you, you want to, you want to hit the capacity. It's, it's just not going to be fruitful. Um, you're, you're probably going to, if you don't injure yourself, you're probably wasting time. So just step back, shake it off, uh, do some other things. And just remember, this is about skill. Once you have a skill, you know, if, if when, when uh, I watch people who can do really tremendous things with kettlebells, they all have excellent technique. If you don't have excellent technique, you can't do cool shit. Um, it's just, you know, you'll, you'll see some of the, you know, some of the kettlebell flow stuff where they're using like three pound kettlebells. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people who can move some serious weight. They all have great technique. So this is where you are. If you want to get to that point, spend some time and learn the skill. 
rather than, you know, twitching and shaking and trying to get the bell overhead without crapping yourself because it's probably not serving you. Unless that's what you're into, I don't want to judge. <laughs> yeah, well said. And, um, and just remember, kettlebells require skill and technique. They're way smarter than dumbbells. It's in the name, okay? So you can't just sit down and whip them around. Make it count when you do this stuff. Now, before we, uh, anybody have any questions? Hey, Jeremiah, I, I do have a question that just. Yeah. Go. Uh, sorry. Uh, in regards to your uh, ladders and the rungs of the ladders, uh, when you start out with like one and two reps or one and two rungs, is it okay just to push it through from one, go directly into two, or you still like to make, take that time and take that rest? That's entirely up to you. Uh, and it, then I would just say, like, depends on what the weight is, right? So if you're feeling good um, and you can, one and two feels really easy and light, it may be time to consider, um, you know, making sure you're at your 60 or 70% max. But if you want to go through it, go through it. Just remember, it's all about technique. If you look sloppy and it feels off when you do it, then maybe it's time to take a step back. As I point out, for me, I just personally like to do that because – uh, it allows me to focus and engage and, and work on the, the technique. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? All right. Well, check it out. So there's a lot of information here today, and uh, we did record it. So if you wanted to review uh, some of the slides Roger had made, uh, feel free to message us directly through either our Instagram page, my Instagram page, uh, or our email address, hello at JanusMovementSolutions.com. And if you're not following us, please follow us. And uh, uh, we are really grateful that you guys all took the time to, to learn with us today and learn from us. I know uh, it's, it's an important aspect that is easily able to just slough off. So we're, we're grateful for that. And... Um, if there isn't any other questions, Roger, if you don't have anything else, then I think we could be done here. And um, yeah, if you feel like donating, message me outside of this and I'll provide you the information. If not, it's all good. And uh, we hope to see you guys at the next one. Um, one, one thing I'll add is if, if anybody here, especially people who've shown up a couple of times, if there's anything specific that you want us to go over, um, let us know. That doesn't mean that we'll do it because we're really bad at following directions. Um, but these... Um, <laughs> these things would be helpful. And, and the odds are, as long as it is something that um, is applicable to a lot of people, and it's something that, you know, we can really spend about an hour on, um, then, then please send us suggestions. If you have simple questions, we can, we're also happy to answer those too. As, yeah, as far as I know, we're going to keep doing these because we don't have anything else to do. <laughs> yeah, my favorite Thursday thing. You guys are doing a great job. Thank you very much for everything. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you everybody. And um, we look forward to seeing you guys at the next one. Bye, guys. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Thanks again. Thank you all. Thank you, guys.